Hey guys! Hi! Happy Monday! Happy Monday! Kind of. (laughs) Yeah, it's kind of Monday. Technically, it's Sunday night because it's going to snow tomorrow, so we're just hanging out um, after small group and decided we would just go ahead and do our vlog tonight so we could just enjoy our little ones and be safe tomorrow, even though it's probably only going to snow like one to three inches. Better safe than sorry. That's right. Um, so we've been loving hearing from you guys. Thank you for all of your comments and your, um, your, your willingness to share with us your thoughts and things that you're struggling with. Um, it's really helping us because we, we're here for you guys. Like Ruth and I feel called to be, be facilitators. We want to be facilitators to have a platform for you guys to have a voice. Um, cause I think so much in this culture with women, it feels like you guys don't have a voice. Um, and, and we want to give you a safe place. No judgment, no nastiness, no ugliness, where we're just supporting each other and building each other up. So, um, one of the things that we got this week was a question and the question was, how do you fight for joy if you struggle with depression? And I was like, because last week I was like crap in my pants trying to figure out what we were going to talk about with like submission submission and I'm like I'm not I am not not no like I can't even get my words now so <laughs> I was really glad that it worked out even though I missed Ruth I was glad that it worked out for her to kind of take the reins on that one and then I had Graham kind of do a little guest appearance so and we will hear from Logan at some point, too, I'm sure. Um, I actually, total rabbit trail, so you just hang on for one second. Um, in our small group, we're all learning to share our stories, and her husband, Logan, shared his story tonight, and I'm like, everybody at the table was like, <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> like, it was so beautiful. So I'm really mm. looking forward to sharing, like, your husband with the world. He's great. Yeah. He's so, he's a great storyteller. So, um, anyways, back to the purpose of this post. So, um, yeah, so though it sounds weird that I'm like, yes, depression, um, that is one of my biggest, most ridiculous areas of, um, sadly expertise, if that's even the right way to say that, merely because I have walked through it and the depths of it and I'm still in it. So, um, I just wanted to share a little bit of my story tonight. Awesome. Um, I grew up in a family that genetically is pretty predisposed to some rough stuff, schizophrenia, bipolar, um, manic depression, and anxiety are all um, rampant in my genetic code um, in my family. So um, I guess it should be no surprise to me that I struggle with it, but I think because in high school and growing up, there were other people that struggled more outwardly in my mm-hmm. life. So I always kind of was just like, oh, you're just hormonal, Becky. Like, oh, you're just tired. Like, you're just whatever. Like, I never really considered having a full-on breakdown, sobbing, like, wanting to just not live anymore because I couldn't find my socks. Like, that's probably not normal. Maybe if you're, like, pregnant. Or going through menopause, but no, <laughs> not normal if you're a 15 year old girl. I don't know. So um, I just would shrug it off, and um, it wasn't until it really reared its ugly head um, in my marriage in probably 2003 um, was when we kind of first had some moments where Graham, my husband, was like, "That is not normal that you like react that way or feel that way," and um, which of course made me feel worse. I mean, he didn't say it that way because Graham's super amazing, but. Um, that's kind of how I heard it and um, I was really you know thinking I could just you know do I, I mean I went to Bible college for crying out loud like I should have my stuff together I should be able to like memorize scripture and like have faith in God that like yeah we can beat this thing and depression's just a blocked goal and Like, God will get me through it. It's just a season. Blah, blah, blah. Right? Like, things that might be true for some people, but really weren't true for me. Because I would find myself over the next two years, um, like, not wanting to get out of bed for days. 
And the worst time it happened was um, when it was a two stint, two day stint, and I refused to get out of bed and I was suicidal. So of course Graham was like forced to call someone. And it was while he was in seminary, and I am to this day so grateful that that was where he, um, where we were at that time, because the seminary we went to had an amazing counseling program, and um, students and student spouses um, got to go for a more discounted rate, um, so we could actually afford for me to get help, which, don't even get me started about how that's a huge problem in our society, but... Um, I was really blessed and really fortunate because I really believe that if that had not been available to us, my story probably wouldn't even exist. Um, that's how bad I was. So, um, so I can remember feeling horrible amounts of shame because your spouse can't sign you up for counseling. Like they can make the call for you, but then if you're suicidal, you have to speak with an actual therapist and like you know agree to fill out a no harm contract which I can remember feeling horrible amounts of shame thinking oh my gosh like they're asking me all right if you feel like you're gonna kill yourself this is your contact information and over the phone you're swearing an oath to us that you're going to call someone before you kill yourself and I was like failure of my life like great here I am like horrible and I just felt a lot of shame and a lot of a lot of hurt and embarrassment. And I felt it for my husband, too. Like, you know, oh, my gosh, my husband's in seminary. He's supposed to be a pastor and his wife's crazy. Like, you know, I just felt so much hurt. And um, it was an afternoon when it happened, so I was able to get in that night. Um, and I can remember sitting in the parking lot for 20 minutes. Um just frozen in fear because I knew just enough about counseling from Bible college to know what was ahead and um, that I had a lot of work to do and it was going to be hard and it was going to suck and it was going to be painful and was I really up to it? Could I really do it? Um, but God divinely wove within me <laughs> a scrapper spirit, so I'm a bit of a fighter. <laughs> And so I finally went in and went in for my first session and just talked and talked and talked and bawled and cried. And, you know, I can remember being so confused and so angry at why my counselor wasn't like entering into the conversation with me. And I finished because I felt awkward that I just like poured my heart out and she hadn't really said anything. And she continued to not say anything. And I was like, Ugh! like, what am I paying her for? And um, in those five minutes um, of silence, she taught me probably one of the most valuable lessons um, that we fear the silence because a lot of times that's when God speaks to us and when we hear God really clearly. And sometimes that can be really scary. And, um, and she just looked at me and said, God loves you. And I, like, was livid, right? It wasn't this beautiful moment where I was like, oh, God bless me, I'm healed. I was, like, just so angry. And um, I'm sure she could sense that because, you know, she's a counselor. And so she said, um, Becky, and it's a quote I live by to this day, you know, God loves us too much to leave us where we're at. And he will do whatever it takes to heal you. And redeem you and it might hurt and it might be hard but he loves you too much and that was my first session and she sold me there because I was like okay like we're going somewhere and I I think I can get on board with this and I went to her for nine months and um, faced some of the suckiest awful parts of my past and you know I love 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 my family but like in every family you know, we're fallen human beings and there's just so much junk that can really go on and really happen. Um, and it blows, but it's probably going to happen to my kids too, <laughs> where they're going to have to be like, mom, I'm in counseling right now because, <laughs> you know, you're a bit of a control freak. Mm -hmm. Um, but 
you know, God's gracious in that. And, and I guess I just want to say that it's not a sign of weakness. It's not wrong. I think sometimes we think counseling is only for the suicidal, like where I was at when I began my journey. Whereas if I had started counseling months before when there were warning signs, um, I would never have had to get to that point. So A, in this talk, I just want to give people hope that if you're struggling with even the smallest thing, whether it's loss or anger or disappointment, um, to seek counsel. Don't go it alone. Um, don't think it'll just blow over and that God's grace is sufficient for you because God also tells us um, that, you know, we're supposed to confess our sins mm -hmm. to each other. And seek wise counsel. Mm -hmm. So yeah. don't, don't play that because I've played that before. So... Um, I think part of fighting for your joy is giving a voice to your struggle, giving a voice to your shame in church today. Um, our pastor talked about how we're in a big series about sexuality and shame right now, which is crazy because we're like kind of tracking Yay. with it by accident, but not by accident because God doesn't make accidents. But um, yeah, like that shame's greatest power is held in silence. So if we're ever going to break this cycle of um, shame, which is us hating who we are because of something we've done um, or haven't done or have left undone, um, you know, we we bathe ourselves in this isolation and this silence, and that's where shame has a power mm -hmm. and a stronghold. And that's not of God. God didn't design that to be a part of who we are. And Christians shame people who are depressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I felt because, yep. really shamed. Not from that community, but from people in my um, more conservative evangelical community. I felt mm -hmm. really shamed from that, you know, somebody who loves God couldn't possibly struggle with depression. So, um, yeah, and I just, you know, at that time I, I didn't take medication it never really came up because I did so much work just you know working through my past and working through my pain and revisiting places of trauma and hurt and really great stuff and she told me that when I had my first child I'd probably have to go back and I did not listen at all and in 2009 I gave birth to my firstborn and um, we had a, a lot of transition. We had, um, you know, a huge death. My grandfather died and we moved and my husband switched jobs. And, um, so there was a lot going on. So I kept like chalking up my feelings to all that. Like, oh, you're crying every single day at 430 for the last three months because you're just going through a lot of change, right? Like it's not postpartum depression. You don't have that. You don't want to like kill your baby or something. But I was very anxious about who took care of my baby or who held my baby or I was, you know beyond normal first mm -hmm. mom concern for sure um yeah so basically I we moved and I everything like evened out we had moved in like I think it was July and then it was that November when I was like oh my gosh like my husband has a great job we're making our bills for the first time ever in our lives we have a home we're close to family now like what is wrong with you Becky and my husband had talked to our lead pastor and kind of said hey I think my wife needs to explore like getting treated with drugs for her postpartum depression how do I like walk through that and he had um, shared his struggle with depression and um, his family's struggles and that was really beautiful for me and his daughter who would come to be my dearest friend um, she picked me up for Bible study and looked at me and said hey Becky you're not the only person that loves Jesus and needs medication for help with their depression and I was like sold because I didn't even know her that well and she like called me right out on it so and I was so desperate to feel better at that point that um, I made an appointment and saw the doctor the next week and we began antidepressants and I was on them for probably two years and then I got pregnant with Ian and did not take them and then once Ian was born, I felt myself like slipping back into that pattern. So I took them again. And um, 
I, this last summer, um, was feeling a lot better and more like, actually I was feeling worse on them. And, um, so I talked with my doctor and we decided to kind of try weaning off of everything and see how I've done. And so far so good. Right. But I still definitely struggle with depression and anxiety, even though I'm not on medication and it's probably something I'll struggle with my whole life in the same way a diabetic struggles with yep. their health and the same way a cancer patient does. And mm-hmm. I think sometimes the church wants to put a really happy bow on it that like, eh, it is what it is. Like, just yep. get over it, pray about it. God will heal you, fight for your joy. When in reality, sometimes we need medication. Yep. But the other end of that is sometimes we don't need medication and people force us into that. So I think my... Of course, sometimes you just need to walk through the pain of your grief and right. and face it head on. And it's only for a season. But if it's a chronic thing where it's brain chemistry, then you need to, you know, mm-hmm. wash away the stigma and just accept that there's nothing wrong with taking something. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So if you're struggling, if you're in a place where... You know, you're feeling like you're fighting for your joy and you're like open to God healing you and walking through the pain. You know, take those steps. Take those steps. Seek God. Seek wise counsel and, you know, walk through walk through your your illness. Walk through your pain because it only gets worse the longer that you wait. And the more you hide, the harder it becomes mm-hmm. to to come out of it yeah don't isolate yourselves you need Mm. wise counsel you need community Mm. really community is what keeps people Mm. from um, really going into a deeper depression I think Mm, definitely so we you know if you don't have that and you're looking for that we would love to be a place for you to come and be encouraged and um, Ruth and I are committing to pray for all of our beautiful kingdom warriors in 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 one way or another figure it out right now we only have like 120 of you so i think we can handle that but if we get into the thousands we're gonna have to come up with a new like thing but for now i think we're good i think we can handle it we know most of you so um you know know that you are loved you know hear my counselor's words that changed my whole life you know to let go of your shame give voice to your your hurt and your pain give a voice to it and allow that truth to sink into who you are that God loves you and wants to heal you and he is crazy about you and um you know yeah I would also say um as far as fighting for joy a good book is 10,000 gifts Mm. is that Ann Voskamp's book yeah yeah it's great and starting a um I can't remember gratitude. what her journal. Yeah, a gratitude, a gratitude journal. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, and because Ruth and I love books, and and this can go either way too, right? Because sometimes for me, like my counselor told me, I wasn't allowed to read any books <laughs> because she said, Becky, you want to fix yourself because you're way too over analytical, mm-hmm. so you don't get to read any books. You have to sit in it. You have to sit in your pain, sit in the spirit of God. Like you can journal, you can read the word, but like. You don't get to try to fix yourself. You need to let God be the fixer. So, what that is like the little warning, like God is the ultimate fixer. There's no book out there that's mm-hmm. going to fix you. Um, there's not a counselor. There's not a drug. Like, ultimately, our issue is that we need to be made right, right? I can't get mm-hmm. over that. Right. With God. Um, otherwise, those are the things might help somewhat, but at the core... You know, we're not going to find the peace and the contentment and the freedom Mm -hmm. that we desire. Um, It's almost like managing symptoms versus dealing with the actual cause, right? Yeah. Um, So, yeah, I think 10,000 gifts. I actually did that when I was... That's so crazy. You didn't even know that. I I did that that. when I was walking through my depression. Yeah. um, When I was on drugs back in 2010. So that was insanely helpful. You It really was. And also another book to explore your emotional um, emotional state and life that was really helpful to me is called it was called the cry of the soul mm-hmm. what our emotions reveal about God and um, 
we it was a really helpful book in kind of walking through um, how God made me to be emotional and that he's emotional and it's okay to be emotional. Yeah. Doesn't make you weak to be emotional. Um, makes you strong yep. when it's done in the power of God. So be encouraged, be loved. Um, know that we're here for you. If you have any comments or questions um, or struggles that you would like us to pray over, we would love to be able to be that for you guys. And yeah, and you're not alone. I said it already. Give a voice to it, right? Right. Give a voice to your struggle. Yeah, bravest thing you can do sometimes is ask for help. Totally. So, and we'll do that to the best of our ability. But if you've got something local or something around you, you know, Google it. Do it, baby. (laughs) All right, guys, we'll see you next week. Have a good week.